So, hello, Miss Gressa Marshall. Hi. Mama Gressa, if you don't mind, I will just call her Mama Gressa for the rest of the conversation. And it's an honor to have you here for Ailey's Diseño. And after 10 years, Ailey has developed hundreds of young African leaders, aligning with some of the Grassa Marshall Trust values, which are integrity and excellence. And um, I've explored these values here in my entrepreneurial leadership classes. Uh, we do something called Values Quest, and we explore these values. But what I found hard is actually to uphold them in moments of uh, challenge. When uh, I have to face uh, a challenge, I, it's always hard to actually stick to my values. So what do these values mean to you? And what is your advice to young leaders? How can they um, embody those values in Africa, and especially in challenging times? Well, um, I think you should congratulate ALA for having chosen amongst the values, excellence and integrity. But I don't think I have an advice except saying that um, as we celebrate these 10 years, if you want to have an example of excellence, for those who have been able to follow the journey of this institution, then there's no much question of what excellence is all about. Of course, excellence is not anything which you say you have achieved. You build along the work daily, monthly, yearly work. But I would uh, suggest that um, you take a look at what would have been excellence after the first year of this institution. It meant something. Five years, it meant something you had built to a certain level. 10 years, excellence, it is different. What you aim to achieve is different from what you achieved at the first year. That's to say, it is an aspirational goal which you have to be determined to build with your effort every single day. And knowing that you are not going to achieve a level in which you say, I've done it. You'll always have to continue to do it. That's the difference of integrity. Because integrity, you choose the, the, the values you want to embrace. And you have to check yourself every time whether you are living up to what you have chosen as your value system. So that can, you can every year put it there and say, yeah, I'm still the same person or I'm still the same institution because between what I have chosen to be and what I am being, there is a match. There is balance between the two. So in short, I'm saying excellence in five years' time can be defined in different terms of what is excellence today for ALA or for any one of us. But integrity, yes, it's something you are in different phases of your life, but you have to be always judging yourself in terms of what you have chosen and what you are being if there is a communication between the two and you can have a peace of mind that yes, you are yourself. So, um, thanks to your values, you are an exceptional person that everyone admires here. And I, I, I said earlier that you were someone exceptional, but some, something that I really admire about you is that you became the Minister of Education at the age of 29. Uh, so you were the first education minister in independent Mozambique in 1975. And um, what is your advice to young leaders? Because you were trust with power, with what I believe is the pillar of every society, education. Uh, what is your advice to young leaders who want to overcome Africa's challenge, challenges at a young age? And how do you think you manage them uh, in Mozambique? The, 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 the truth is that I didn't manage. <laughs> 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 I, 
The truth is that I didn't manage. I did my best, but I wouldn't sit here and tell you that uh, I managed well, I mean, the challenges of uh, dealing with power. But I became minister in a very extraordinary time for Mozambique, which is not your case. We had just came out of uh, uh, the bush. We were a new country. We were a new team. By the way, it's good to know that I was 29 and the youngest was 28. But the average of our government, our team, the whole of the team, actually they were in their 30s, 34, 36. So we were all very young. But it, we were given an opportunity to start something completely new. None of us had, had been in government. And actually, the president at the time when we were complaining, you'd say, do you think I have ever been a president myself? <laughs> so all of us, we have really to open new avenues. And uh, I have been, I, I, I only had to respond to a call. And I had to learn with others how we could really devise what ended up being the first national system of education. But I think uh, I was uh, also lucky that I had people who were much older than I was. They had much more knowledge and experience than I had. If I have had any merit, it was to put together this team of uh, what it was, my support group in the ministry. So it was not a personal success. It was a collective su success because of the people we have been working together. But yet, you are asking about advice. I take a little bit of um, humility to advise because the context in which I became minister is completely different from yours. But if there is anything which I believe is still valid is that contrary to my case, I didn't choose to be a minister. I was told to become minister. You will be in the situations where you have to make a choice. Because you are many of you educated with all the tools that you are brilliant, but you have to make a choice. I didn't make a choice, I was told to. You have to make a choice to serve. And particularly when it comes to public service, what happens nowadays is that young people, even the most brilliant, they still hesitate to take a public position. I'm glad that uh, the introduction, the speech we had here is that come, I don't know, I think she said like 50 years from now, I would put it lower. I would like to see in 10 years time, 25 presidents. We don't have to take that long actually, but the presidents, ministers, and et cetera, et cetera, in all those public positions, yes, seeing ALA graduates, ALU graduates, being the one who having learned, having have given, the possibility of thinking and actually crystallize what it means leadership, then to, talk, to take those leadership positions. And as young as you are, because you respond better to the youth, to the youth of our population in the, in the continent, we have very, very young people that can only respond to you as young people being in position of power which means we don't have to continue to have presidents who are 70. We don't have to continue with parliamentarians who are in their 60s. We don't have to continue to have uh, uh, ministers who are 70 something, 60 something. Sometimes when you happen to have a president who is 50, we all say we applaud, oh, he's very young. But the majority of people in this continent, they are in their 20s and 30s. You are the one to lead them. Because you understand, it's your life. We stopped a long time ago to be young, and we cannot understand fully the world in which you live in. We can, I think we, if I have to give advice, 
it's to say we are somehow generations which came be before you. And in the chain of life, you always need to step on the shoulders of some. We also had to step in the shoulders of those who came before us. You need to build that chain of life. Don't be disruptive in the negative sense. Be disruptive in inventing solutions. But at the same time, the history of this continent, it's not yet written. Many of it, it is still with people who are alive. That's why I, see, I say you step on that. We are part of that history. We have to offer it to you. But more than that, it's your world, more challenging, quite different. You just have to have the courage, the courage to make a choice, to sacrifice, to serve, knowing that in African context, you are not I, you are we. This is how we define ourselves. African identity is defined in collective ways. So when you are on top D, you have always to be aware of who are the we you are serving. That's perhaps the only advice I could give. Okay. I would love. And as I said earlier, you are committed to uh, children and women's rights. Uh, so I wanted to know what you think will be the, the role of women and youth in some years from now in the development of a more inclusive continent. Uh, which advice would you give also to women and youth in order to create that environment where we can have equality and where we can develop ourselves without limits. I think you can take the example of uh, uh, here. You are treated equally, isn't it? Hmm? And you are challenged equally. I think that's the beginning of what we are. To so it's not an issue of tomorrow. It's an issue of today. It's whether you are relating as young men and young women, you are relating in a way you accept the dignity of each one of you, and particularly the dignity of young women, you respect that, and then you are behaving in a way on a daily life you know and you practice that a woman is not inferior to a man. That is, uh, that is not an, a task of the future. It's the task of the present, actually. I would dare to say that one of the challenges of uh, our times, it's exactly for people to accept the dignity of a woman as a full human being, not half as the, the woman having not only the capacity, because it's not a question of what she has learned and what she knows. Uh -uh. It's the question of who she is, and in that who she is, to accept that she is at a level where you can never question her dignity and her participation. <laughs> so to young people, to young people, I think this is a big challenge. Because I hear many times, I mean, good things being said. But in practice, mm, I'd like to ask here, and the question I will leave here with the LA graduates, those who are still at school, those who are working already, just to ask one thing. Girls, do you really feel safe at home? Do you feel safe at work? Do you feel safe even at church? That you are being accepted? Are you? No? That is the problem. And it's not because these people do not know what human, human, human rights and not. all the theories are very well known. But in practice, women don't feel safe even at home. And even from someone who has taken long time to look into her eyes and say, I love you. 
you are my, and say all those kind of things. But the moment there is a difference of argument, for any, it's just they're arguing. To argue is fine. I mean, you, it's okay to have difference of opinions. But if she asserts herself, she doesn't put herself in a position of uh, being the inferior, then she's beaten. And sometimes she's killed. Simply because she dared to assert herself with her opinion and with her beliefs. And she is trying simply to get into the thinking of her partner to say, I'm equal to you. And because I'm equal, I have the right to think differently from you. These are the problems we have. So we are not talking only of whether at work, even there actually, at work we can ask in many places here, very few countries have achieved what we call equal work, equal pay. And you will not have any explanation to say why a woman who is qualified has expertise, has experience, she is doing excellent job. Why she's paid less? Simply because she's a woman. So the problem we are asking, it's not of the future, advice for tomorrow. It is how do we today really look into the eyes of her as I look at you? And I'm so proud of your brilliance. And I have the humility to accept that you are better than I am. You see what I mean? And I don't judge you. I don't judge you because you are younger. No, I'm, I'm fascinated with the brilliance of who you are and take pride on that. And this is the question I would like really to ask men and women, young and old in this room. What is it we have to do to cross that bridge, that bridge of acceptance? of the dignity of a woman first, and of her brilliance. And it never, never discriminates simply because she happens to have been born female. That's a big issue. It is, in my view, in my view, one is that, is the, the, the issue of gender. The second one is race. In our times, to get to a point where I am African, and actually I happen to have dark skin, so you can't even question, huh? So you see me, you know that I am an African person. And simply because of that, you are table, I mean you have a, a tag which says you are supposed to be inferior, and you are supposed to be treated differently. These are the two challenges in my view of human family today, it's accepting that a woman is equal, is accepting that a black person is not inferior, is, is equal. We have a problem. <laughs> now, I would, like, I would like to leave with you young people to say, please take this as a fundamental, fundamental transformation of the mentality so that it should not come from your generation to continue to discriminate against women and to discriminate against each other on the basis of being black or white. If you do that, then the next president of, of my country and wherever it is, it will be a different quality of presidents, different quality of ministers, different quali quality of, uh, they will be just, you know, leaders, as you are leaders who are fundamentally human. Just to be human. That's it. And what are the challenges you faced as a woman at that time and even now? Mm -hmm. Baby girl. <laughs> Let me ask you. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, it, because I don't know how much time we have, but perhaps, Wait, it, minutes, have perhaps it's my time. <laughs> you, you'll be surprised. I can answer to that. You'll yes. be surprised. You'll be surprised to, to hear that uh, I have all the time to be mindful that people will uh, 
look at me and listen to me and they they will think she it's a she okay mm -hmm. one she is black she's african and my challenge is exactly to in any time just to try to tell people that I'm a human being and I'm absolutely complete. I'm not, I don't want anyone to judge me and think I'm small simply because, so that's my biggest challenge. It's still, it's still alive. You would think that because of my age, because of positions in which I have been, it's something which has been resolved. No, 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 it has not been resolved. It has not been, so that's a challenge. But I want to ask you something. Okay. <laughs> because now it's not me alone. You, 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 we touched, and this has been triggered somehow with the conversation I was uh, part of this morning, I was listening. What does it, it mean for you to be an African, a young lady, so a girl, okay? You were born in Cape Verde, Senegal, etc. now you are in the U.S. Hmm? What? What does it mean for you to remain, to remain profoundly African and to, to tell in practice in how you are everyone that you are so proud of being African and to take them to acknowledge and to respect you? What is it? How, how does it work? That's a, that's a very good question and very... <laughs> so, you are right, actually. Being a young African woman is a hard combination. It's a hopeless combination for some people, Not but hopeless. I don't, th I don't think hard. so. Yeah. Not hopeless, it's, it's a hard. hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so, because the continent, as you said earlier, seemed to be against some, uh, our perception of women's empowerment. And in a few months, I will go to the US, so I will be in a school with 3% black people. And how am I going to uh, reclaim my African identity, explain to my peers that Africa is not a country, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that um, Africa has potential that I believe in, and that I didn't get a scholarship just because I'm black. And also that Black Panther is not a good movie just because black people are in it, and uh, as if we were not worth success. And um, because you can hear something like, you're doing great for a black girl. Mm. But what <laughs> they should say is, you're mm. doing great for a human being full of potential and intelligence. Mm. Uh, because we're black, but we, are, uh, we have potential. So I think being an African woman is having responsibility, first of all. Mm. Uh, and coming to LA, you explore that um, responsibility, you explore your African identity, mm. and you realize that you want to come back on the continent, actually, mm. and, um, and bear the African responsibility of, uh, of changing the, the narrative and reclaiming your identity. Because you can't change something you don't believe in. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the perception so people can believe, my generation can believe, and can change the continent. And I want to say that there is no problem that cannot be solved by a young African woman. And that's mm, mm, mm. You challenge me. You challenge <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Again, you see, let's go back to your first question. Mm. When you, you asked me, how did I do it? And I said to you, I was grown, I, I did take up responsibility in a totally different environment. Now you have put it right. You see, mm. I, 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 I did not have, I was in Mozambique, you know? I have to start from Mozambique and then to go to the continent. And only late in life then I had to be thrown into the so-called global, okay? Mm. While you, simultaneously, you are from Cape Verde and Senegal, you have been to LA, you are an African, you are global in all this you still have to remain profoundly African. That is a much bigger challenge for you than it was for me. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay. And this is what we, we, we have to try and, uh, and see. How do we 
in our generation, my generation, some of the people are sitting here. How do we contribute somehow, if we can? Mm -hmm. How do we contribute for you, for you to reconnect with your African roots at the same time where you are global and you have to be global, mm -hmm. but at the same time you make the right choice, absolutely unequivocal, that you are an African and you want to save Africa and you have to change. That's, that's much more complicated. Mm -hmm. And I have to acknowledge that your choices are not exactly like our choices. Our life was much easier, okay? So as we, uh, you call them friends of Africa, perhaps I'll say as we mothers and fathers who are here, we have to be absolutely mindful of that. It's not an easy place where our children are. And if we are not very intentional, intentional in supporting that the African identity is something which we are reclaiming, it's something which we are rebuilding, and it has different features. It's, it's go going to be something imperfect along the way because the influences which we have sometimes will be much more stronger than the ones which are coming from the continent. And yet, if you're not profoundly African, you're not going to transform Africa. As the Japanese, they do the Japanese way. The Americans, they do the American way. The British, they do the British way. And you have to do the, the African way. So how do you do it? And how do you discover that? And you embody this in your practice. That's the challenge we're talking about. So African Leadership Academy, African Leadership, African Leadership University, for instance, has really to come to a point. I think I did challenge here one of the times I came, that you need to build a body of knowledge which all of us can begin to recognize that these are the fundamentals of what we call African identity. We need to have that base of knowledge because otherwise we will be talking about a hundred things and we'll understand a hundred things, but these young people who are to transform this continent, they have to be stepping in a very solid knowledge of what it means African identity. That would be perhaps my change, my challenge here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank we you. have to go, isn't it? We were given 30 minutes, and I'm afraid yeah. we have done more than 30 minutes, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so but thank Diana. Thank you very much. Diana. Yes. I want to I want to, to be able as I would say the same about Priscilla, but perhaps I'll talk about Priscilla much later. I want to be, before I retire from retirement, <laughs> I want to be able to watch you growing in the ladder of all the opportunities which uh, 21st century, you know, offers you. You grow, you fly, but as you fly, you always know that you can come down here and you are rooted in African soil, in African values. And you know also that some of us, while we are still alive, even if something goes wrong while you are flying, we'll be here to sustain you. So you will never break. You will never break, you will never break your spine. You'll never break your spine because we'll be, we'll be here to sustain you. That is it, what I call the chain of life I was talking about. We have that responsibility to sustain you. And God bless you. Thank you very much.